So today, Dr. Scholz, we're talking about the treatment for bone mets. Now, we've covered in previous videos the concept of systemic treatment, but there's so many more treatments when it comes to targeted therapies and radiation. So um, for people who are just coming to this video, can you describe um, how prostate cancer metastasizes and what parts of the body it goes to in the bones? Yeah, people don't realize how prostate cancer has its own specific character. Now, there are exceptions, but there the generalities are quite useful. And that is that if prostate cancer spreads, it likes to go to either lymph nodes, which are little, little bumps connected to the immune system that scattered throughout our bodies, and uh, lymph nodes more frequently that are close to the prostate, that would be in the pelvic region, or to the bones. And again, to the bones that are closer to the pelvic region first, and then to more distant spots later. Those are just generalities. but. The good news is that the likelihood of finding prostate cancer in other critical organs like the liver or the brain, uh, and less likely the lung, is pretty low. And this uh, is good news in the sense that uh, it's organ damage from progressive growth of metastasis that can cause uh, early mortality from any kind of cancer, including prostate cancer. Lymph nodes and bone are very forgiving for the presence of abnormal cells and they can compensate and work around those abnormal cells and people can live many years even after the disease has spread to these sites. So what type of imaging does one do in order to determine that there are bone mats? Well in the old days we did bone scans and we did MRIs and CAT scans. Um, these days with the advent of PSMA PET scans, usually we just get a PSMA PET scan and those are very accurate, much more accurate than the previous scans that I mentioned. Typically with one scan you get all the information you need now if you get a PSMA PET scan. What type of scans do you suggest for people who may not have access to a PSMA PET scan? Well historically we would do technesium bone scans and uh, for those that have uh, financial wherewithal, F18 PET bone scans were shown to be more accurate, often not covered by insurance, unfortunately. MRI gives you the most specific picture of what's going on in the bones, but it's not practical to do an MRI of the whole body. Uh, if someone has an area that's hurting, or if a bone scan shows an abnormality, an MRI can zoom in on that and give more precision clear information about the size, location, and nature of any metastasis. So in previous videos, we've talked about what they call oligometastatic, which is less than five metastatic sites on the lymph nodes or bones. How is that treated versus metastatic lesions that are more than five all around the body? Yes, I think especially now with PSMA PET scans, but even before, it has been clearly shown that uh, zapping spots in the bone can effectively control disease. Uh, this has become uh, a greater reality with the advent of PSMA PET scans because we're more confident that what we're seeing on the scan represents the lion's share of the disease. The older scans weren't that good, and so we would see probably half or less than half of the metastatic lesions, and so zapping spots seem to be sort of a futile undertaking because you're not getting all the disease. That can be true with PSMA PET scans, but it's less likely. And now it's more likely you're seeing the lion's share of the disease. And by zapping the spots with external beam radiation therapy, uh, the possibility of extended disease control is good. And usually this type of therapy has uh, relatively little, if any, side effects. So when I hear you say zap with IMRT and get those sites, you know, when I think about radiating a bone site, is there any sort of pain that the patient would feel with radiation going to a bone? No, in fact, it's uh, historically been the number one way to relieve pain is with IMRT. The methodology that was used in that situation when people would go in for 10 visits over, over a two week period and they would give relatively small doses of radiation and pain relief would be quite excellent with little if any side effects whatsoever. What's changed in the these more modern years is and instead of just trying to control pain and to slow the cancer down with modest doses of IMRT, larger doses are given now to actually cure the spots. And uh, it is good to make clear uh, with the radiation therapist that you are going for disease control, not palliation of pain. There are, are different protocols that the radiation therapists use. And I think most modern radiation therapists in the United States are up to speed with the idea of using larger doses over a shorter period of time to eradicate the disease in the bone. You say, well, why wouldn't they just eradicate the disease in everybody? 
Well, with higher doses, there is a slightly higher risk of weakening the bone and creating a propensity for bone fractures in the future. So there's a trade-off with these higher doses, but the idea of eliminating the cancer is so attractive. In most cases, in my judgment, it is worth risking that possibility of weakening the bone to truly eradicate the cancer altogether in that spot by using a large enough dose of radiation. So some patients in this category have osteoporosis and they have weakened bones. Is there ever a case in which you, maybe somebody gets a scan and their bones are so weak they can't get spot radiation to the bones? No, but in this context of talking about uh, bone health and, and the possibility of prostate cancer spread to the bones, it's good to talk about normal measures that are should be implemented routinely in people that are uh, almost always on hormone therapy at the same time that they're getting these treatments. It's very, be very unusual for someone to be getting radiation to the bone for metastatic lesion and not already be on hormone therapy, which as we all know can cause osteoporosis or calcium loss and generalized weakening of the bones. This is something that also comes with aging. So you get a, sort of a double whammy of uh, loss of testosterone and aging leading to progressive calcium loss and potential bone weakening. And all that is basically just a setup for talking about another type of treatment. Uh, well, there's several types actually, but the most pop popular one being denosumab, a f um, injectable medicine given in variable doses and in variable frequencies to, to stop calcium loss from the bones. And uh, these are FDA-approved medications that not only helps uh, forestall progressive osteoporosis, maybe even build up the bone, but also have a modest inhibitory effect on cancer growth, prostate cancer growth in the bones. The only problem with these medicines, uh, denosumab being one, and other uh, older medicine called Zometa also does this, and uh, there are oral agents like Fosamax, Boniva, and Actinil that can do these things. The problem with these medicines is that occasionally they can slow bone metabolism to such a great degree that you can develop weakening of the jawbone. Uh, uh, sometimes a loss of tooth or a, or a non-healing um, uh, wound on the gums that can be painful and uh, very slow to resolve. Uh, the good news is that with cessation of such treatment, usually the problem does resolve itself. In the meantime, however, it can be really sort of an ugly situation. And the prescribed doses that are recommended with monthly injections of denosumab for people with bone metastasis, in my opinion, are probably excessive. It has been shown that the larger doses are more frequently associated with this jaw problem, which we call osteonecrosis. The policies that we've adopted have been to give the injections every three months or every six months to hopefully uh, receive some of the benefit of these medicines in building up the bone without going so far as to create osteonecrosis. So when we talk about patients who have had spot radiation to the bones and then they're on hormone therapy, how often do you have these patients maybe in the oligometastatic category, um, again with meds under five, also on early chemo? The idea of early uh, chemotherapy as opposed to, quote, late chemotherapy. Early chemotherapy means that you're giving treatment at a time when things are going well, that the PSA levels are declining. And uh, many people question this policy. They're wondering why. My PSA is going down. The cancer spots are going away. Why are we doing more intensive, potentially toxic treatment? And the answer is, it's a view towards the long term. We know that cancer over a period of time can become resistant to these different uh, methodologies to hormone therapy. And if an effective anti-cancer agent is introduced at an earlier stage when there are fewer cancer cells, we get more bang for the buck in terms of its anti-cancer efficacy. Studies have actually proven this to be the case. And so people with bone metastasis probably can qualify in the sense that their disease is serious enough to, to consider a policy like this and that they may benefit over the years with uh, higher cure rates, um, or at least delay in the time of the cancer recurrence. So this mindset is um, usually reserved for people with bone metastasis, occasionally for people that have only lymph node metastasis, although that's a little bit more debatable. So we have other treatments that have um, been around for a while, like Zofigo and Provenge. I know that Provenge is an immune system um, kind of a booster for the immune system to fight cancer. Does that have a direct effect on any sort of metastatic lesions? Well, it appears to inhibit cancer growth. Uh, Zofigo is an injectable radium that only treats bone metastasis. Provenge is an immune therapy that can inhibit cancer growth anywhere, including lymph nodes, bone, or other sites. They each have their role. Uh, Provenge is very attractive because it's uh, a non-toxic treatment that's given over a six-week period. 
and has been proven to prolong survival. Uh, Zofigo probably has more role in people with multiple bone metastasis uh, who have advanced progressive disease, chemotherapy is not working, hormone therapy is not working. And in that setting, it has been shown to inhibit cancer growth and to uh, uh, enable people to live longer. Uh, it's a simple monthly injection, usually with minimal side effects and uh, has been associated with a reduction in bone pain if people are having problems in that area. So is there a, like a minimum or a maximum that you've seen when it comes to metastatic bone um, lesions where Zofigo is you know, either really effective or ineffective? Well, there's no maximum. I mean, the people that were studied in Europe in the original approval trials had scores of spots on their bones, and that was where it was shown to be most effective. Uh, it's a less plausible treatment in people that have less than five spots because you can easily zap those with external beam radiation, such as IMRT or SBRT. So the usual role for Zofigo then is people with more than five metastases in whom other treatments aren't, do not seem to be effective or have stopped working. I know a question I get asked quite often is when it comes to zapping metastatic bone spots, um, is IMRT or SBRT better? Well, SBRT is delivered over a shorter period of time and therefore is a lot more convenient. There's really no argument, I think, now in 2023 that you need to be extending out to 20 or 10 or or more visits, that uh, five visits uh, should be sufficient to get the job done, and it's less doctor visits for the patient. So what type of side effect profile would a patient who has these you know, combined therapies have? You know, we're, having, we're talking about being on hormone therapy, which we know has its certain set of side effects, but then you also have um, you know, going under radiation and then the possibility of chemo. When you have these patients who are going through these multiple types of treatments, do they tolerate it very well? Yeah, I'd say the unifying side effect that we see is fatigue. And the patients that dedicate themselves to a fitness program to keep the, their bodies strong and their muscles well-developed do quite well in terms of enduring these treatments. The spot radiation, uh, where they're treating a couple of spots in the bone, usually that has no side effects at all. Chemotherapy and hormone therapy can be associated with fatigue. Rarely spot radiation can cause a little bit of fatigue that may last for a week or so, but it's usually not a big deal. A more recent treatment that has been FDA approved is lutetium, and this is a um, a treatment that's been being done in you know Germany and Australia and in Turkey, and now it's been approved in the U.S. Can you describe what this is and how it works? Uh, it's an injectable form of radiation that's smart enough to swim around in the blood and find the cancer and radiate it wherever it may be in the body. It sounds kind of magical when you describe it that way, but it, it actually does perform, and there have been studies now showing that people that receive this treatment compared to other traditional treatments live longer. And it, uh, I have seen a number of patients who've had dramatic declines in PSA who otherwise had run out of options. Their chemo had stopped working, hormone therapy had stopped working, so lutetium, so-called Pluvicto is a trade name here in the United States, is a, um, a medicine injected every six weeks, and it's quite effective and well-tolerated. Most common side effect is some uh, dry mouth because there's some collateral damage uh, in hitting the uh, salivary glands. But this uh, seems to be a relatively small price to pay for something that is so effective and generally otherwise well tolerated. So with an injection every six weeks, um, how long is the entire cycle of the treatment? It doesn't work in everybody. So typically two injections are administered and PSAs are rechecked to ensure that there's some benefit occurring. Uh, and in more than half the people there will be, and then often the treatment will be continued for a total of six injections. And what does the PSA decline look like? You know, with radiation, we have a PSA declining over time. With certain treatments, it's right away. How does lutetium fare? The uh, general thought is that if there's no, uh, at least stabilization of a rising PSA after two treatments, that it's probably not effective, and you need to think about di different alternatives. What percentage is it really putting patients like in remission versus it's stabilizing versus it's not working? Well, probably in general terms, you could say a third, a third, and a third. A third of the patients seem to get dramatic benefit, and another third seem to get disease stabilization, and about a third perhaps it's not accomplishing a whole lot. So one of the things that I think about with the type of treatment that lutetium is, is, you know, it's an injectable that swims around the body finding these sites. How does it compare to Zofigo? Well, I think Zofigo, uh, because it only treats the bones. Radium only goes to the bone. It doesn't go to lymph nodes, to lung or liver, or any of these other important sites that uh, become that come into play, especially with very advanced prostate cancers. It doesn't really compare to to Pulvicto, where it's it's not only 
hitting every site, that consistent declines in PSA that are occurring in a significant minority of patients are uh, much more characteristic of a useful treatment than the, when Zofigo, you may see some PSA decline or stabilization. Uh, we also look at alk uh, alkaline phosphatase to see if the Zofigo is working or not. But use of Zofigo is, I think, more appropriate in people that uh, don't have many other options. The disease is uh, pretty advanced and uh, perhaps are having some bone pain and uh, they can get some relief with a fairly simple monthly injection. Plavicto, I think we're hoping uh, for uh, more substantive results with you know, PSA responses and regression of disease, improvement on PSMA PET scans, whether it be in the bones or the liver or the lungs or the, or the lymph nodes. Uh, it's a more of a global treatment. This was approved last year in 2022. Um, how many patients have you seen treated with Pluvicto, and what type of responses have you seen? We've had patients that were traveling outside the country for the last couple of years to receive this treatment, and it, it falls into the one-third, one-third, one-third category that I talked about previously. We don't know with any specific individual how it'll play out, but uh, after two treatments, you'll have a sense of whether the, um, does, uh, the treatment is effective and whether it should be continued. So today we talked about bone mets and we talked about the treatments for those bone mets. I know it's a lot of information, but you're here doing your research. So first of all, that's really awesome. But the point is that I want you to feel empowered by this information. If you have a doctor who's not presenting this treatment to you, you know, bring this up to him. Maybe say, hey, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? I heard about it and I want to know more. The thing is, I want you to feel empowered to advocate for yourself. I think a lot of times when we're in either maybe an HMO or a VA system, we kind of go with whatever we have access to, but there may be other ways to get access to these drugs and even get second opinions. So please research your options even in those categories because we want to make sure that you're not only getting the options for treatments, but also the options for doctors with somebody you're going to feel is really going to take care of you. We care about you and we want you to have the most optimal treatment process that you possibly can. Please remember that your quality of life matters through all of this and to take care of yourself because you are important. Please remember you could also go to our website, pcri.org, for more information and much love. I hope you have a great week.